It is not uncommon for people to disappear, never to be seen again. But what if I told you it were possible to disappear and at the same time have everyone know exactly where you are? Sounds confusing, right? Well, that sets the scene perfectly for today's story, as we dive into this 74-year-old mystery that continues to be investigated by authorities and sleuths throughout the world. This is the story of an unforgettable man whose identity remains unknown despite vigorous efforts, and we're going to explore the frustrating way gentle pulls on the threads of this investigation quickly unraveled an open and closed case into a confusing mess that tells a compelling story of taboo affairs, foreign espionage, and supposed third-generation descendants who have been left questioning their ancestral lineage. This is the story of the unknown man, whose last few hours alive and dead body went unnoticed on a busy beach, and the cryptic mystery that unfolded during the decades of investigations that still offer no reasonable explanation about who he was or why he ended up dead on the beach. John Lyons was a veteran of the First World War. He returned to his profession as a jeweller and settled with his wife Helen at the beachside suburb of Somerton Park in the city of Adelaide, South Australia. The year was now 1948 and it was a time when it was not uncommon during the post-war years to see men living rough, battling with alcoholism and sadly there were many who decided it was just all too hard. It was 7 o'clock in the evening of November 30th and John and Helen were taking a walk from their home to nearby Somerton Beach which was a nearby stretch of sand bordered by a 5 metre high boulder escarpment, supported by a seawall at the lower end that was intersected by staircases that would provide access down from the promenade. Together John and Helen walked and talked, catching up on the day's events and eventually coming to the section of the promenade across from the crippled children's home when they noticed a man in a relaxed half lying half sitting position on the sand with his head resting against the sea wall. Now this was not particularly unusual and they simply assumed he'd hit the turps all day and had a gut full of piss from the 6 o'clock swill with 6pm being the mandatory closing time for bars. This assessment was reinforced when he raised and extended his right arm as though he was trying to light a cigarette before limply dropping it to the sand, giving the impression that he was drunk and in need of a rest. About 30 minutes after John and Helen had passed by, another couple, Gordon Straps and Olive Neal, were walking along the same section of the promenade and paused to rest on a bench, overlooking the man and also noticing him slumped against a sea wall. Now this is a time when people didn't look the other way when seeing someone who may have needed help. So Gordon and Olive kindly thought to go and check on him, but as they approached and got a closer look, they seemingly assumed he was just drunk and sleeping it off. But in hindsight, they did consider it strange to seem so undisturbed by the encroaching mosquitoes that were harassing him for their evening meal. So the man remained unattended to, with the evening sun setting not long after and local residents would return to their homes to catch up on the evening radio shows before bed. The next morning, John awoke enthusiastically to the first day of summer. It was December 1st, 1948, and he celebrated by returning to the beach at 6.30am to enjoy his first swim of the season. He once again made his way past the crippled children's home and headed down the stairs, stopping by to see two men on horses, overlooking the man from the night before, who remained undisturbed on the sand. Apprentice jockey Neil Day and his mate Horry had stopped by to see if the man was alright, with Horry coming down off his horse and lifting up the man's unresponsive leg and dropping it back down on the sand, confirming their suspicion that he was not sleeping off a few too many drinks. He was dead. John's plans for a morning swim ended abruptly and he quickly ran to a nearby payphone to report the shocking discovery to police. Apart from the apparent signs of death, the body appeared as inconspicuous as it had when he and his wife Helen had walked past almost 12 hours before. Their initial impressions were that the man had made himself comfortable on the sand, leaning against the rock wall and at some time gently passed away as there were no signs of disturbance or violence. Dead bodies turning up along the suburban beach was not an everyday occurrence, but men ending their lives was a part of the landscape of the period. Nevertheless, police still took these matters seriously and 15 minutes later, Constable John Moss arrived to attend to what should have been an open and closed case of an unsuspicious death. The body was taken to the Royal Adelaide Hospital, where Dr John Bennett determined the likely time of death was around 2am, based on the state of rigor mortis, which is a method of assessment that has since been dismissed as unreliable among the medical profession, who now consider a wider scope of indicators, such as lividity, body temperature and the state of cloudiness in the eyes. This would later lead some people to speculate that perhaps the man had died at a different time, with his body maybe even being placed on Summerton Beach by some third party. Based on his appearance and possessions, the man didn't really fit the profile of a wayward drunk. He was estimated to be around 45 years old, 
was clean shaven and tall with a good physical appearance, being dressed in expensive clothing that consisted of a brown double-breasted coat that investigators would later define as American tailoring with an unlit cigarette resting on the right shoulder collar. Underneath this nice coat, he wore a brown pullover covering a white shirt that was paired with a red and blue tie, being stylishly matched to brown trousers, fine socks, and fashionable shoes. Interestingly, he was not in possession of a hat, which was a standard fashion item for a man about town at this time. But his clothes were indicative of his social status. Not exceedingly wealthy, but certainly not poor. However, there was little help in trying to work out who he was. An intentional effort had been made to remove all identifying information, with the clothing labels being meticulously stripped away. Nor did he have a wallet or any personal papers that might offer a clue as to who he had been. Did a passerby pick his pockets? while he lay asleep on the sand or dying that night? Well, although he did not have a wallet, the contents of his pockets did provide some insight into his activities the previous day. Among the items was an unused second-class rail ticket purchased that morning from Adelaide to Henley Beach, which is about 11 kilometres or 7 miles north, that he may have missed or decided to take some other change of plans. He also carried an unstamped bus ticket from the city and a narrow aluminium comb that had been manufactured in the United States that he used on his straight-back hairstyle which was a more popular hairstyle in the US, compared to parting the hair to one side, which was more common in Australia. Also found was a half-empty packet of juicy fruit chewing gum, which seems unusual given that most of his rear teeth were missing, so it must have been hard chewing gum without chewing teeth. Interesting. Everyone was a smoker back in the 1940s, and this guy is no different. His brand of choice appeared to be Army Club cigarettes, but appearances can be deceptive. Upon closer inspection of the packet, there were seven cigarettes of a different mid-price brand called Conceitas. Now, the interesting point of note is that Conceitas was a more expensive brand than Army Club, but for some reason he chose to carry his preferred brand in the cheaper Army Club packet. This intentional levelling of wealth presented an image of being not too cheap, nor too expensive, and this was reflected across all his possessions, creating the appearance of a man who could easily go unnoticed by passers-by in the street. Standing on his fingers and tobacco fibres found in his pocket would also indicate a tendency to roll his own cigarettes, and when it came time to light the fires, he was stocked with a quarter-full box of Bryant and May matches. A post-mortem was conducted by pathologist Dr John DeWire, who described the man as being in a top state of physical condition, standing at 180 centimetres or 5 foot 11 tall, which was reasonably tall for a man at that time, with grey eyes and fair to ginger coloured hair that was slightly grey around the temples. He had a strong body with broad shoulders and a narrow waist and hands that were noted to be extremely soft and clean with neatly trimmed nails that showed no signs of manual labour. His feet were somewhat unusual with his big and little toes pushed together forming a wedge shape like those of a ballet dancer accustomed to tight fitting shoes and his legs had high and well developed calf muscles that were also consistent with a dancer or people who regularly wore boots and shoes with high heels. He also had some unique genetic peculiarities, such as the lack of lateral incisors, which are the spacer teeth located between the front incisor teeth and the canine teeth. And this condition affects only about 2% of men and creates a noticeably unusual appearance or a distinguishing feature that would make him memorable to those who knew him. Also of note, his ear cavities were distinct in size between the upper and lower openings. Again, another genetic oddity that exists in very, very few people. But for the most part, it was unnoticeable. Concluding his assessment, Dwyer determined the cause of death to be the result of cardiac failure, but also noticed the strong suspicion of poisoning as being the only explanation for the significant congestion of blood found in the man's stomach and other organs. However, government chemical analyst Robert Cowan had conducted tests and was able to exclude most poisons except for glucoside poison, such as digitalis, known as a medication for treating heart conditions. But it seemed unlikely as a small dose would have taken too long to kill the man, while a large dose would have been detected in the autopsy. So with no satisfactory cause of death, police were at a dead end for clues, but expected someone would soon notice him missing and come forward to identify the body. Taking into account Dwyer's indication of possible poisoning and the possibility of a crime on their hands, less than two weeks later on December 10th, the body was embalmed to preserve it by pumping in formaldehyde, which was noted by police as the first time such a drastic action had to be taken. But with no one coming forward to claim the body, the police appealed to the public by reaching out to the media worldwide, with the enigma of the mysterious corpse becoming referred to as the Summerton Man, and soon enough responses started coming in, with this unclaimed body suddenly becoming the long-awaited answer to families of missing loved ones, with some coming to inspect the body only to realise it was not their missing person. With nothing gleaned from the man's possessions and no information gathered from the public, 
The investigation failed to progress for the first six weeks, with some historians blaming the ineptitude of police. But on January 14, 1949, a breakthrough was discovered when detectives Leonard Brown and Lionel Lean were assigned to the case, quickly discovering an unclaimed suitcase left in an Adelaide railway station's cloakroom that had been deposited there on November 30th. The same day, the Somerton man was seen by John and Helen Lyons during their evening walk along Somerton Beach. With a whole suitcase full of personal possessions, it was expected that the man's identity could finally be determined. While the Somerton man was consistent in his attention to detail and efforts in remaining inconspicuous, as with the clothing he was found dressed in, the baggage label had been characteristically removed. However, ownership by the Somerton man was confirmed by forensic investigators who matched the thread in the case to also having been used on the coat he was wearing. And finally, a name had been found, with T. Keen being labelled on three items of clothing. So again, this information was pushed out to the media for public awareness, and one man came forward, a ship's master who claimed the suitcase could have belonged to Tommy Keen, a local sailor. However, a visit to the morgue by the ship's mates quickly determined it was not their Tommy. Investigators were unable to find any record of missing T. Keen and acknowledged it was possible that these clothes had simply been purchased secondhand. Although the clothing was a bit of a letdown, the suitcase contained several other objects that would enable investigators to speculate on his profession. These items included slivers of zinc, a stenciling brush, a knife with a sharpened point, and a pair of honed scissors. Items which were associated with the profession of third officers on merchant ships, whose job it was to stencil labels on cargo. But apart from the ship's master who responded unsuccessfully to the Tommy Keen lead, there were no records of lost mariners, and it would also seem questionable that a mariner could maintain exceptionally soft and smooth hands. Perhaps these items were also picked up secondhand for some unknown reason. In the end, it seemed all investigators had retrieved from the railway station cloakroom that day was a suitcase full of further questions and mystery, which once again led them to a standstill. Then in June, the coroner Thomas Cleland reached out to his first cousin, renowned pathologist Sir John Cleland, who proceeded to re-examine the body, which at this point had been resting in formaldehyde in the mortuary for the last six months. The body was preserved, but not pristine, so John turned his attention to the belongings, and in doing so, discovered a key breakthrough that would shift this John Doe case away from being a mysterious but otherwise uninteresting possible poisoning, with John's findings setting the tone for what would become decades of intense examination, scrutiny and conspiracies. All this came about through the chance finding of a tiny scrap of paper about the size of a ball of lint concealed within the obscure fob pocket of the man's brown trousers, and inscribed on this paper were two words. To Moon should. To translate this seemingly non-English word, police sought the assistance of academics from the University of Adelaide. However, a publication in a local newspaper produced a quick response from the community, which identified the language as ancient Persian, with the words to Moon should, meaning the end. The words were most prominently featured in the 1859 translation of the Rubaiyat, which was a book containing verses by the 12th century astronomer and poet Omar Khayyam. Preceding the finality of its closing words, the end, the book read, Whilst we are alive, we should live life to the fullest, and when it's time to pass on, do so without regret. Tamun should, or the end. This message about the finality of life prompts the questions. Was this an acknowledgement by the Somerton man that the end of his life was inevitably close? Or was this the discreet signature of an assassin, maybe a less is more message intended to serve as a warning to others, along with the publicly deceased? Whatever it was, it was a purposefully vague message with a seemingly unlikely chance of discovery that if found was intended to communicate a message beyond the grave of a man who was stripped of information concerning his identity. While police once again issued an appeal to the media and law enforcement throughout the world, seeking the copy of the Rubaiyat with its final page missing, and amazingly, someone responded several weeks later. A chemist named John Freeman who lived in Glenelg, the northern adjoining suburb to Somerton Beach, presented himself to police with the book and told investigators that on November 20th, which was 10 days before the body on the beach was discovered, he was attending the Parafield Air Pageant with his brother-in-law, and during that time, someone had tossed the Rubaiyat into the front seat of his car while parked unlocked on Jetty Road, which was about 30 minutes walk from Somerton Beach. He thought it was a little odd, but attached no importance to it, instead placing it in the glove box, where it remained until he heard the police appeal on the radio. Forensic experts were able to immediately identify where the text to Mun Shud had been removed from the back page, which fitted into place perfectly. So with the link between the Somerton man and the Rubio discarded 10 days prior to his death, questions now arise about who placed it in the car and why, rather than just throwing in the rubbish if it was no longer wanted. 
Furthermore, how did the Tmunshud text get extracted from the book and concealed in his pocket? Given he had a knife and scissors in his suitcase, why would this message of apparent significance be ripped from the book? And if he was responsible for placing it in the car, what transpired over those 10 days leading up to his death? There were no reported sightings in hotels to indicate he'd been staying in the area, but 34 years later in 1982, a woman came forward with information she had not liked to reveal at the time due to a lack of evidence and her professional commitment to confidentiality. But she would go on to state that while working as a receptionist at the Strathmore Hotel in North Terrace, she had become suspicious of a male guest who was described as being well-dressed and well-spoken. She was so worried about his behaviour that she ordered a search of his room, but the only item found by staff was a black medical case containing what looked like a hypodermic syringe. Aligning to the period of the Somerton man, the man from the hotel checked out the day before the discovery of the body on the beach. But that's all we know. The Rubaiyat would go on to reveal further secrets, with forensic investigators identifying two phone numbers inscribed on the back cover. While well, one of those phone numbers was linked to a local bank, perhaps indicating he'd been involved in some sort of financial dealings recently, maybe even aligned to circumstances surrounding his death. But there's no record of investigators pursuing this lead any further. Instead, they chose to focus their attention on the second phone number, and that was listed to a nurse named Jessica or Joe Ellen Thompson, who also went by the name of Jeston based on the nickname of Tina for being tiny because she was only 4 foot 11 tall with the name Jess being combined together into Tina, which evolved into Jeston. With an apparent child, Jeston claimed to be married to George Thompson, although they did not marry until the early 1950s, but together they lived at 90A Mosley Street, Glenelg, which is located about five minutes' walk from Somerton Beach. Now, this aspect of the story was met with official dead ends, but would become a focal point for sleuths in the decades that followed, for the facts were, Jeston's phone number was found on the Rubiat linked to the Somerton man, and her home was in the immediate vicinity of the place his corpse was found. So please take note, there are no coincidences here, only unanswered questions and mystery. What was the relationship between Jeston and the Somerton man, and only living five minutes walk from his place of death, had he visited her on his final days alive? Examination of the Rubiat by forensic investigators also revealed what appeared to be some sort of coded message or cryptogram written in faintly visible pencil markings, which under magnification revealed a sequence of 50 letters written in five lines containing three spaces. To play some context around this, the finding of this complex code had the indicators of espionage tradecraft. The year was 1949, the beginnings of the Cold War, and less than two years prior, under Operation Venona, American cryptanalysts at the US Army's Signal Intelligence Service had cracked messages transmitted from the Russian embassy in Canberra to Moscow, and only two years later, KGB agents would arrive in Australia in an attempt to conduct an overt abduction of Russian defectors. The country was at a heightened state of alertness, and South Australia was a hotbed for spies collecting information concerning the new Woomera rocket range that was to be used for nuclear weapons testing. The Somerton Man mystery was showing red flags that this death may have been above the pay grade of South Australian police, who reported the code to defence authorities, who assigned intelligence analysts who spent months trying to break the code without success. By this stage, the Somerton Man had been held in storage for about six months, and it was finally time to put him to rest, with the burial taking place at West Terrace Cemetery, marked by a headstone inscribed with the words, Here lies the unknown man who was found on Somerton Beach, 1st of December 1948. To keep sightseers away, police ensured the service was conducted in secret, and members of South Australia's Grandstand Bookmakers Association generously contributed to provide him with a dignified farewell. Shortly before the burial, taxidermist Paul Lawson was commissioned to produce a plaster cast of the Somerton Man, with the hope from investigators that a three-dimensional representation may provide a better chance of the man being recognised. But the accuracy of his likeness was somewhat degraded following the autopsy and the extended period of storage following his death. This has since been addressed by a Hollywood special effects expert who was able to create a more accurate image, but in 1949 the cast would have to do. Investigators couldn't help but notice the apparent link between the Somerton Man and Jeston, so they brought her downtown to review the plastic cast, with taxidermist Paul Lawson present during her visit and later recalling her being noticeably confronted by what she saw, appearing as though she was about to pass out in response. Yet she told police she didn't recognise the man. Jeston was also questioned about any information she may have regarding the Rubiat, and she stated she gifted a copy several years earlier to a man named Alfred Boxall, whom she had met while studying nursing in Sydney. Alf was a friendly acquaintance who was departing on an Australian territorial deployment during the later part of the Second World War, and it was a common thing to send men off with a sentimental gift. 
The immediate presumption by police was that Alf must be the Summerton man. Case closed. However, they soon found him to be alive and well, living in Sydney and remaining in possession of the undamaged book. The link to Jeston remains an important but unsolved mystery. However, she requested to have her name removed from the case and often moved houses or went away on a trip over the following years when the story re-emerged, always remaining silent to questions about whether she knew who the Summerton man was. This now brings us to a couple of possible explanations extending beyond the facts that we can be certain of that a man's body was found on Summerton Beach. The first possible explanation is that the Summerton man was a spy who sought to conceal his identity yet had some sort of link back to Jeston, who may have been his handler, the conduit of spy communications back to the country of origin. It makes for an exciting story, but is this really plausible? Well, Jeston's daughter Kate believes it very much is. During an interview with 60 Minutes, she recalled her mum having a dark side, a very dark side, and said she believed she may have been a Soviet spy, with examples of having her to speak in quiet Russian on the phone, and once hearing a comment that she was surprised she could still understand Russian. But when asked when she learned the language, her mother responded, well, that's for me to know. She also said that her mother once told her that she knew who the Summerton man was, but didn't tell police because it wasn't at their level. A second possible explanation that Summerton man with pointed toes, muscular calves, soft hands and a strong body had been a dance performer who suffered a rapid terminal illness associated with a significant blood congestion throughout his organs. He may have sought some sort of assistance from Jeston who was trained as a nurse, having known her previously to a level of trust that perhaps included gifting him with a copy of the Rubiad as she had done previously with Alf Boxel. An extension of this hypothesis is that Jeston being married had a romantic relationship with the Summerton man leading to the birth of their son Robin the previous year, who for all intensive purposes was the child of her husband George Thompson. But the Summerton man may have come to Adelaide in the 10 days preceding his death in the hope that he could build a life that included his son and maybe even Jeston. But being rejected, he chose to end his life, leaving behind the cryptic clue to Munshud or the end that only Jeston would understand and the code which has never been cracked may have simply been some sort of meaningless puzzle of letters. Now this jaded lover hypothesis is a plausible explanation given that Jesson's baby boy Robin would grow up to resemble a close likeness to the Summerton man, including missing lateral incisor teeth found in only 2% of men, and also the distinctive ear shape. The likelihood of both these genetic features being present is very, very finite. It's also interesting to note that Robin spent his life as a professional ballet dancer. You could almost say his choice of profession was in his genes. In the early 2000s, an electrical engineering professor from Adelaide University named Derek Abbott began pursuing the story after reading of it in a magazine while waiting in a laundromat. He became immediately hooked and identified the value of DNA testing that would enable confirmation of progeny linked to Robin using a hair found in the Summerton man's plaster cast and a sample from the proposed love child. But disappointingly, Robin had only recently passed away with his DNA destroyed from cremation. A second line of inquiry led Derek to Robin's surviving daughter and possible granddaughter of the Summerton man, Rachel Legan, and Derek committed himself to the research process, immediately proposing and marrying Rachel and also obtaining a sample of her DNA, but the Summerton man's hair proved to be unreliable in obtaining any accurate results. The best way forward would be to collect a more complete sample from the remains and in May 2021, the Summerton man was dug up with DNA collected and the analysis remains ongoing and is expected to perhaps take years to reveal any ancestral links. What we can be certain of is that a man's body was discovered on Summerton Beach on December 1st, 1948. Everything else remains an assumption with still no closer to understanding what happened on the morning before John Lyons went to take his swim on that first day of summer. Thanks for watching. Consider checking in on Passed Out Drunks and I'll catch you next time.